Hello, Sina. How are you doing, man? <laughs> Good to see you. Hi, okay, Kevin. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Sina, um, yeah, I've been, uh, we've been, you know, chit-chatting like uh, back and forth for some time now. And you also know uh, Zia from Iran. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it, but uh, hopefully next time I thought we could maybe also do some kind of, you know, panel discussion. Uh, but Sina, uh, really great to have you here. Um, uh, since I don't know much about you and my audience uh, does not, doesn't know much about you, do you want to like introduce yourself, like your background? Uh, you're also a business professor. Uh, maybe you want to talk also about uh, your um, BDC, uh, the, Bit, the Bit Guide, uh, where you teach. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, show. first, thanks a lot for inviting. Um, great to chat with you. So basically, uh, I, uh, with, with, with a colleague of mine, RK, we started Bit Guide. I think it was uh, uh, early this year where uh, we basically thought, thought there isn't enough, uh, you, you know, quality sources of information to teach Bitcoiners about the fundamentals. And personally, on my end, I felt that absorbing information in the Bitcoin spaces has become so difficult. Anything you search online, you basically first have to scour through, you know, a hundred uh, links that are trying to shill you some nonsense or some other uh, uh, fake project or something. And then you, if you're lucky at the end, you will find some piece of good information. So we thought there's a gap here for uh, curating and collecting information, for example, you know, all everything that a Bitcoiner needs to know about the, the concept of money, right? Um, that was something we started uh, to record a course on, and then we expanded into other things. RK also has done a few technical ones about custody. Although we are a bit uh, moving a bit slower than we like, because uh, we have to live and uh, do uh, attend to our fiat jobs, but uh, we're moving along. So that's one thing. Other than that, I'm just uh, watching what's happens uh, in the Bitcoin world and uh, having fun. These days, a lot of people are crying about the bear market and prices going down and um, entertainment never ends. Um, oh, uh, on, on, on my fiat job, yeah, it's I teach business, uh, business professor. Um, and, uh, that kind of gives me a nice, uh, overlap because I love learning about business and economy and it overlaps with, uh, money. So I'm just basically trying to approach Bitcoin from the perspective of, uh, economics and, and money and what it means for, uh, the global uh, macro economy, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. And then, uh, I haven't been to Iran for a long time, like you. Not not as long as you, but uh, more than a decade, I think. And uh, but I've been like after I learned about Bitcoin, I started to reach out to other Bitcoiners in Iran and uh, just uh, figure out what's going on in the community. And uh, so I've I've been in touch secondhand, basically, with what's happening there. And uh, yeah, we were just waiting to see. Um, uh, what, what happens with all the all the changes that are you know occurring at the same time with what the Fed is doing, what Russia is doing, with the rumors about BRIC countries getting together and trying to make a new currency? Uh, all kinds of in interesting things are happening. Iran is doing some great stuff with uh, supporting mining and supporting usage of Bitcoin. So yeah, lots of uh, interesting directions. Yeah, we've had some uh, several calls, uh, uh, talks with Zia and uh, Marty Bent, even I think on a panel discussion. And uh, you know, and I mean, I was, you know, as, as I said previously, you know, off the record, uh, I'm, I'm, I was in Iran like last time, 1979, 1980, like one year after the revolution. We, we we went back with my dad to visit sort of my 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 mom because they were divorced, and you know, and so. Uh, but otherwise, you know, I grew up over in Austria and United States, and I, I lost somehow total like base or touch, you know, with 
um, and, and I know a lot of Iranians who went back, you know, to visit the families and they said, you know, it's, it's weird. It's a weird feeling. Uh, maybe you could share a little bit about your sentiments, your perception, your impressions. Um, a lot of Iranians, friends I have, they say, you know, they went to visit friends, family in Iran. They said the feeling, uh, you know, the whole perception has changed. It's like, uh, is, is that true? Like, you know, I mean, I do remember, you know, I have like vivid pictures and memories. Um, I just want to have like a general overview of your sentiments before we go like deep dive into Bitcoin. Um, sentiment, it, it's such a broad uh, thing. But one thing I can say is I already feel uh, a difference in mindset. And I'm not sure if this was all, all there all the time or maybe I have changed or something. Um, although we can't, we have to understand, you know, what's going on in Iran. The economy isn't really functioning there because of a variety of reasons. And that that also impacts people. So the, I, I feel like the general a, a sense of optimism um, doesn't really exist. Um, and something that might link to crypto is you see a lot of people who are ready to believe stories and too eager to become rich too quickly. Um, these things generally, at least in my limited uh, experience, these things generally happen when you have desperation. So, um, um, and, and then a few other the, cultural... Sorry, interruption, on top of that, all the sanctions and embargoes that have been going on for decades now, right? I mean, the people, it's, it's the people who have been suffering, like, right, on top of that, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, we have a great youth population, highly educated, lots of potential, but a, a non-functional economy, which means it doesn't create engaging jobs for all these people. And uh, when you are, you know, you have lots of potential and you're not able to use it, you have hours and hours of free time and uh, you, you aren't earning uh, commensurate with your skill level then it uh, causes uh, lots of problems. You know, some people actually, it gets to some people's uh, uh, minds and you kind of tend to do some weird stuff. And uh, when you get sufficiently frustrated, uh, you are more, much more likely to believe, um, you know, the next savior who comes along and wants to save you. So that's my general feeling. It's not, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not so positive, but, but um yeah, there's this undercurrent of um, things just not working as they should. And you see this in many other countries too, like in, in every other country that has suffered long-term economic troubles, um, you see optimism down, you see happiness metrics down, um, uh, and, and this all ca causes all kinds of other psychological issues. Um, but... Uh, at the same time, you have a very active and uh, smart and perceptive community of um, young folks who are uh, punching above their weight. Uh, I am really, you know, initially I, I didn't have much of a much of an expectation, but once I learned more about people and the crypto community, for example, uh, every day I'm amazed to see such talent over there which doesn't get uh, the credit they they deserve. Um, also, because of the political troubles between Iran and the Western country, you, we don't get enough of uh, a recognition in the media um, or even human rights organizations. It doesn't pay to really uh, pay attention to Iran, right? Because they're also partly, um, you know, partly marketing organizations, right? So it just doesn't pay for them to reflect what's going on in Iran or maybe even allocate some funds or other things. So it's like an uh, underappreciated um, community, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, and they're doing amazing stuff. So that's something uh, something that's uh, that needs more attention. In my, and... and uh, 
maybe maybe that's uh, in the next podcast we can we can bring up a few of the active uh, more more active folks in the in the community and talk about exactly what what they see on the ground um and that should be really cool uh, actually a couple months ago realizing that uh, iran isn't really getting the attention it, it it deserves compared to the amount of work and effort and enthusiasm there is about crypto i just wanted to write a uh, write an article uh, for Bitcoin Magazine to explain all of these. Uh, it's moving very slowly, though, because uh, I need someone who has first-hand observations. But um, but I'm happy that you are interested in this. Totally curious, yeah. So, Sina, um, you, I mean, I talked several times with Zia and some others about the demographics. You, you mentioned like lots of lo young people. I think I had this number like sixty to seventy percent of the population of Iran's population is approximately or below 30 years of age correct me if i'm wrong and and yeah and uh you know i just wanted to like to find out like uh, uh like what i mean they're definitely you know extremely smart and educated but uh do they have are they hopeful i mean do they have a vision um uh, do they see like uh, you know a, a, a bright future you know uh rooted in bitcoin is is that because yeah um, well, in Bitcoin, I can see there is a lot less um, hype about Bitcoin. Um, like when you go to Bitcoin Twitter, um, you get, I don't know, maybe just roughly speaking, 90% of the stuff are hype and uh, uh, hyperbole and that kind of thing. You don't, fee you don't see that in Iran. So people are more kind of, level-headed if that's the right word um but what really bothers me is that shit coins have a lot more of a reach so because you know financial education is globally a challenge right uh, but it's it's much bigger deal in iran so people at least in my limited observation they don't have the very basics of uh, economic or monetary understanding so they really fall for um fall for basically everything i mean it's not even like big shit coins like there are also locally grown shit coins like the whatever uh singer or famous um celebrity um that people like in iran they come up with their own coin and it doesn't get enough criticism or um, actually find some some people to follow. So um, that's that's something that's a really concerning trend. Uh, you are already not so well off, and then you're also falling for these scams, which makes you uh, suffer more. And I've tried I've tried a lot to basically shed some light on this and help, but there's just uh, so much you can do. Uh, when you're up against um, a, a whole machinery of, uh, you know, marketing and uh, there's lots of money in shit coins, right? You can't really uh, go up against their marketing. So, but they have captured all the uh, all the space. That's that's a big big trouble. Uh, as far as hopeful about Bitcoin's future, um, what can I say? Uh, I think there is a general understanding um, about the challenges of fiat that's there, uh, but maybe it needs to be more, uh, uh, there needs to be better education to differentiate good and bad money. But at least everyone knows in Iran that uh, real is bad money. <laughs> so people at first hand uh, know inflation because there's no way out of it. It's, it's part of life. What's the what's and, the rate? What's uh, hype what, what what do we have uh, hype inflation? I mean, what, what kind of rate are we talking about? Like forty percent, fifty percent? Like what is it? Like do you know? Or is it just uh, fluctuating? Uh, like because backwards? they lie all the time, you never know. But you have to observe the numbers, like forty, fifty, sixty. Um, easy, very easy. I think official numbers get close to forty percent, but it's probably more. Um, and 
I have completely lost my sense of prices. So like when these days somebody says this thing costs this much, I have no feeling of uh, how much that is because all the numbers have changed. Um, like just thinking about it right now, I think um, the salary I was receiving 10 years ago, now there are people who receive 10 times that and they're still below poverty. So um, it's, a, it's, it's a fact of life, you know, inflation is there. And this generally though, there is, uh, there are some impacts due to, you know, economic mismanagement, but a, 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 I guess a bigger piece of that is just, they have no limits in expanding the money supply and do whatever they want. At least in the U S there's lots, there are lots of eyes watching the system. So there is kind of some more discipline uh, but over there, it's free. It's it's a it's a free field. You can do whatever you want, and uh, all the time, as as we see everywhere, when you give people uh, total power over the money, it goes in one direction. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's the nature of fiat systems, <laughs> or whatever centralized uh, systems. That's it's no. Always. We just have bad and worse fiats. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, yeah, I would love to like, um, I got this article of it's even on BTC times, you know, it's a very short article about, you know, this new law, whatever you call it, the cryptocurrency law, it's not called Bitcoin, like uh, Iran approves Bitcoin payments for imports. Uh, uh, have you <laughs> have you uh, read a little bit about this? Do you know have do you have more information like uh, about using Bitcoin for, for imports for trading? Yeah, so I looked it up a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, especially I looked up the actual source to make sure this is something legit, because you never know. Um, uh, so let me give you some background. Well, obviously, uh, Iran has lots of trouble in uh, exports, right? And uh, uh, with all the sanctions and uh, SWIFT ban and all, it's become um, difficult for them to move um, dollars and basically export and things like that. So they are one of the... Uh, you know, more likely candidates to welcome a new system. Generally, like those who are doing well in the current fiat system, they are going to be the last to adopt any kind of a new uh, arrangement. So uh, particularly like Iran is an energy ex exporter, right? And when there is trouble in, in export, uh, you have to find uh, these weird mechanism to be able to uh, get paid for uh, what you're sending out. For example, sometime they had these arrangements of uh, uh, oil for products. So they would export oil and immediately import some kind of products with it so that they don't have to move uh, funds around. Um, and uh, more recently, they have discovered that there is some potential in uh, crypto um, they are they are heavily exploring the space, um, not just Bitcoin, everything, and they're also uh, um, uh, investing on um, uh, CBDCs. So they call it digital real or something like that. And uh, this shows that they have this strong interest in that. That's unlike many other governments. So they're taking this thing very seriously. And I think they look at it as an opportunity to figure out how to export more products and all. Uh, so that that's that's uh, interesting. Uh, specifically about what happened is I think they had uh, initially banned uh, Bitcoin transactions uh, through a combination of explicit bans as well as uh, creating lots of uncertainty. So for, for a time, uh, miners were kind of getting shut down and uh, getting raided and all the uh, equipment uh, would be seized uh, because we have some energy troubles in hot months as well. Uh, in, in, in many cities in Iran, they have uh, no electricity in, in summer for maybe one or two hours every week or so because there's demand is more than capacity so in in, the, in those times it's understandable that they want to uh, limit miners 
But there has been so much fervor and interest in, in mining for such a long time that uh, it, it turned into this uh, underground industry. So they came down hard on it. But now what happens recently is they, they actually started uh, clarifying the regulations. So what you were talking about is some, um, uh, I'm not sure uh, what you would call it, but the administration put out a, a guide guideline uh, that directs the agencies under that to uh, treat mining and Bitcoin as uh, basically legal activity. So you can actually get legal license for mining and they would then control what kind of resources you're using, how much electricity you use, and then they give you the specific prices for that. You can't use regular electricity that is uh, uh, supplied to uh, households be because I believe the prices of those are all uh, subsidized. So they control that. A lot of people use subsidized electricity, which is uh, subsidies already a, 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 a huge mistake, but then also allowing uh, uh, all kinds of other business activity to use that as a second, uh, um, uh, second problem. Um, and then there's, a, there's also, uh, there's just some, some aside, uh, there's also a lot of institutions who have uh, political connections that allow them to use free electricity. Um, it's kind of an exemption from paying for that. And then all of them had also started uh, extensive mining operations um, in their garages and uh, basements and all. So sometimes even maybe the whole business wasn't really paying enough. The, you, you couldn't turn a profit in the actual business, but the because of the free electricity, your mining operations would, <laughs> would keep you afloat. Um, so the, all these things, you know, mess up with the energy infrastructure. So they kind of uh, created this legal framework where you can uh, legally operate and then... Uh, get electricity and energy from um, the sources that they approve. Um, they did the same thing for ga natural gas, right? I think mm -hmm. natural gas also has limits in the winter. So mm -hmm. you can, uh, you have to basically agree to shut down your miners uh, uh, in those times. But if you do that, you can mine legally. The only other limitation they put it, they put on is uh, you, you still cannot use the mined Bitcoin for uh, internal transactions. So they are they are creating this uh, uh, huge incentive for trying to import with that, uh, with, with the Bitcoin. And, and if you think about it, that makes perfect sense. You're dealing with an economy that has trouble finding, finding dollars. So there's a huge dollar shortage um, and uh, they have trouble uh, making international transactions. So if you as a Bitcoin holder mm -hmm. uh, try to use your Bitcoin to import some goods from wherever, maybe China, uh, you have basically exported Iranian energy and you've imported some foreign product and you haven't used any um, dollar infrastructure, uh, at least uh, officially through Iran, because some people might might send their Bitcoin to some offshore uh, place to then turn it into some of the more common currencies. Uh, but still, that's a way to go around um, the troubles they have. Um, so one thing I would say, it's, it, it is very clear that the administration understands the potential and, tr and, and, and thinks of it as a way to get around the limitation that's put, put on them. Um, if, that's, if, I'm, if I'm right, that would mean some sustained and strong support for growth of this ecosystem, um, which is a very interesting development. Yeah, you mentioned the legal framework for Bitcoin mining. Uh, just uh, two, uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, if it's done, like, you know, I guess uh, the Bitcoin miners get uh, granted like a license and do you know like how much fee or taxes or what, whatever goes away? like? How much do they have to pay or you know to the state to the government to the agencies or whoever and then the other question was uh if they do it if they get caught illegally you know what's the what's, what's the what's the penalty like you know. so they see if if you get caught first of all they do catch people which is very interesting given how uh, ineffective they are in other things uh i don't know maybe they cooperate with um 
network providers as well as energy providers and they have some pretty cool uh, pretty good maybe machine learning whatever they detect and they're having people because iranian people are really savvy right so they will find ways but in this case uh any miner i've talked to they they had instances where uh their uh, illegal operations were discovered so that's that's one thing uh, usually what happens is they seize all everything you have and uh, I don't know, then you have to go through the, a long, painful process of paying some fines and getting them back or sometimes you can't even get, get back the equipment. Uh, I, I don't have any idea about what kind of fees they would charge or what kind of uh, um, uh, trouble they would create for you. Um, but one thing that was clear in the announcement was that if you actually use your Bitcoin for exports, there's pretty strong uh tax exemptions uh that you have uh the, when i was reading it it really appeared that uh, you are exempt from uh uh business taxes uh altogether uh but we, generally you also have uh you, you know ir ir iranian regulators are uh, generally on the side of over regulating everything so you can expect some um difficulty in going through the process and maybe some cost but that's not preventing uh, miners from um, expanding they're actually thriving uh, i think some of the statistics are about five percent of the, the global mining is done in iran which um you know think about the uh, maybe the size of the economy compared to the size of the economy that seems uh, very substantial so uh, yeah, the, the ecosystem is growing a lot and it's actually in this weird dance between uh, population growing activities underground as well as government trying to find some opportunities in the space while tr trying to control it sufficiently so that they, it doesn't kill their own currency, right? You always have this trouble. You wanna use Bitcoin for international business where you have trouble but it's kind of a Trojan horse too. It kills your own uh, currency as well. Once people figure out that, oh my God, this thing actually appre appreciates nonstop compared to the local junk that we have, um, then it's you're done. The, the, you can't really control it anymore, right? So they have to kind of uh, be very conservative and try to... Um, to, you know, have this laser micro approach to regulation only for these activities. We allow crypto and, and Bitcoin and not for the other activities. Um, but I think I tend to think once you open the dam, uh, you can't control it. Um, and uh, one last thing I would say is they're also pushing this CBDC very hard, apparently. Uh, they're publishing papers on it. They uh, have uh, lots of government-sponsored discussions and uh, explorations. I don't know where they where they're going with it. Maybe it's just curiosity, but um, there is some some serious funding behind the, behind it. So, um, yeah. Well, what's the intention in Iran when it comes to so so-called yeah CBDCs like? Is it about like, you know, as they literally say, you know, like uh, the speaker of what do you call it? The International Bank, of, uh, Bank for International Settlements, absolute control. Like is it about control, surveillance, uh, controlling everything, you know, <laughs> or. So I read uh, almost I quickly read a, a big document that they put out um, a couple months ago or, or a couple weeks ago. Um, and uh, they said the exact same stuff, but more politically um, careful. Uh, one of the one of the reasons they actually mentioned for going after CBDC was policy. You know, all these uh, Keynesian monetarist uh, policies uh, uh, recommend central banks to play with the supply of money whenever they feel like it. Uh, frankly, because there's no way you can exactly know how much money there is and exactly know how much expansion is needed. So it's like a guess, game of guessing, which is Federal Reserve does, right? Uh, the only trouble is you don't have total control over the currency that's uh, in uh, that's that's circulating. 
you can try to inject some money into the banking system, but that has to find its way through the actual economy. If you want to force people to uh, 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 spend, right, you can play with their rates and so create some incentives, but that doesn't necessarily mean it, it ends up pushing people to spend, right? They these guys want to be want to have total power to force you to spend when you don't want to, right? Um, uh, again, Keynesian. Uh, uh, nonsense. So uh, that's one of the ideas, and, and it's really troubles central bankers because they they see that they don't have that much control over uh, people's uh, spending habits. So, but if it's all digital, it's a uh, you press a button, and you know you only have people only have two weeks to buy stuff, and then you can even better you can actually say what you can buy, right? You can say you know this thing is not allowed. So um, none of your cards would work for that. You can immediately ban everything. You know, you're dealing with an environment where the regulator has a huge list of things they want to ban, right? If they are able to control financial flows, um, it's as easy as pressing a button rather than trying to find a huge army of people going after this and that and who, find who is using this and controlling. It's, it's so difficult. But if you have control over financial flows, you don't even need to touch the real economy and real activities. You're just dealing with data and uh, who and, and they, they love it. They should love it, at least. Uh, so that's one one thing. Uh, the other one that they mention is the cost of handling cash, which is a legitimate uh, complaint. Um, cash is generally expensive for these uh, for governments. You know, you have to replace the paper. I don't know, manage What's happened, and also using cash is not as ideal, um, uh, harder thing to do. Um, but we don't, we didn't have anything better, uh, better than that for privacy uh, previously. But but now we do, so um, somewhat uh, less of an objectionable um, rationale. But not a, but there was no mention in that report about the ability to increase surveillance, which is uh, probably the number one goal, but it's not mentioned. So they're more careful about it. Um, I guess in, in the in the US, we've heard a few explicit, uh, or, or actually in, in um, uh, from central bankers world, worldwide, we've heard explicitly that they like that control and observation. But um, uh, yeah, they mostly, I guess, uh, officially, they, they were mostly talking about the ability to uh, implement policies better. Uh, what are those policies? Have they ever worked? Never, uh, but they just want to have more freedom to implement those. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for the, for this um, ex for all these explanations. Um, so Sina, um, I mean, you, you said you, you were in Iran like 10 years ago, but um, I guess, I assume you, you, from time to time you talk to, you have friends, relatives, family, like, or you know within Iran or who travel back and forth what do they do they report to like or do they tell like you know do people like use mobile wallets what's you know what do they use I know Zia does a great and fantastic job like educating people unfortunately my Farsi my Iranian language is not uh, so good so I can't really follow up on what he's doing exactly but he's doing great educational work for it for sure um, uh, when it comes to self sovereignty, like you know, uh, would it be you know using mobile wallets, uh, self custody, hardware wallets, uh, coin joining, uh, transacting privately, privacy? Is uh, what's what's your like perspective? Like what's going on in Iran when it comes to all these things? Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> to some extent, uh, people are aware of the importance of privacy a, a bit more than you see in the Western population because everything uh, apparently, at least on the surface, works and you don't suddenly get seized. You, you, your bank account doesn't disappear that easily. Uh, but in Iran, like people, uh, a lot of people use Binance to uh, trade crypto or um, um, uh, buy or sell or things like that. And you know, Binance sanctioned Iranian users, um, and some of them found suddenly that they don't, they can't access their uh, their money, and uh, and similar things also happen internally 
uh, with higher frequency. So people are more aware of the fact that you need to think about privacy because uh, it, for many of them, um, if, if the other party knows you're from Iran, uh, it might not be a great thing to uh, great. Uh, you, you may run afoul of a bunch of regulations. You know, many businesses are not allowed to off, to offer services to Iranian users, right? So, for some of these reasons, uh, basically, Iranian people have more uh, need, more urgent need to preserve privacy. And I do see uh, Bitcoiners in Iran are are very uh, aware uh, of these tools. And uh, they have uh, functioning, well-functioning communities where they share information. Like Zia again is a great example. Uh, he's an, he's a powerful force for distributing information and educating folks or, uh, about these things. Um, and I can see there are, there's a lively discussion and a very a friendly uh, community there helping helping each other. But Bitcoin only community is uh, kind of small and uh, the majority of crypto enthusiasts are n outside of Bitcoin. Um, and those guys, the way I feel, uh, it's more about a short term trade and all other monies on exchanges and no attention to privacy and, and all that. Um, so, um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have better news for you, but uh, but I'm very, very proud of the Bitcoin community. Um, they are like uh, they are actually a great source of information for me too. I mean, I go to them to ask questions uh, rather than you know finding. Uh, uh, it's harder for me to find really good information even even uh, from my network in the U.S. So uh, that part is good, but then the other part, like you know we can actually do a poll or something but uh, if i were to guess like 95 percent of people who do altcoins they have no understanding no good understanding of privacy or coin join or things like that mm -hmm. well i know i know i have one cousin um from my mother's side who lives and works in in germany and in europe and uh and i know you know he's he's done also uh, great. I mean, first of all, he's a total Bitcoiner, you know, full nodes and everything, you know, and I think he convinced a lot of people, especially within his family to, you know, start saving. Right. I, uh, I think there was even a talk like selling real estate or whatever property they have uh, and turn it into Bitcoin. So would you say like uh, what percentage of Iran's population is like more or less like full Bitcoiners? Would you say like one percent, two percent or uh, I don't know. I have no idea. It's hard to say. Uh, mm -hmm. But what I do know is there's a very active, uh, probably like everywhere else, I guess, but there's a pretty active, a strong, and unfortunately successful group of, um, you know, shitcoin shields. Uh, everyone has a shop that's selling some kind of a fake trading program that uh, turns you... Uh, from a poor guy to a rich guy overnight, or um, <laughs> so much. Yeah, these Zia actually confirmed that in several talks. It's like saying so much shit kind of going on in Iran. It's 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 my yeah. Mind. It's uh, oh my god. You know, initially when I w when I got in touch with the community, like I had started out in Bitcoin maximalist toxic communities, and I took that mindset and went to Iranian chats. And I was constantly in fight with people, you know, <laughs> I was talking a completely different language. And, you know, the guy shows up and talks about all these possibilities that blockchain opens up. Oh and I, I'm telling him, hey, I've been following blockchain supply chain applications for more than five years. And this is my field. And I've never seen any real applications. What are you talking about? And you just couldn't get the message through because of so much you know they take these stories that shitcoiners put out there as truth they completely believe the whole thing without much of uh, research uh, i mean again not much different from the sh typical shitcoiners in other countries but what is concerning is because possibly this could be a reason 
that there is less of an interaction um, for between people inside and outside. So they might have gotten into this bubble where um, they hear the same thing from all the businesses around them, which is a bad message. And a and Bitcoin or message doesn't get to them. Um, so when your sources of information are all corrupted, what can you expect? You know, um, but in but still, again, I'm uh, my initial uh, horrible experience got a lot more softened and and nicer once I learned about Zia and everybody else who are in legitimate, uh, knowledgeable and uh, serious Bitcoiners. Yeah. So um, it, it's actually very, very interesting. And, uh, and, and every time I'm locked down, Zia sends me a few examples of people um, creatively helping Bitcoin. And maybe um, there was this guy who went out and convinced a bunch of businesses to accept Bitcoin. Oh, really? Uh, Great. Like and put it on social like media. Like bizarre people, like that. This is what I was going to ask. Regular you, like, people, like yeah, 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 like a hairstylist or uh -huh. I don't know some other store, uh, boomer type businesses, you know. Um, <laughs> and and this is great again because there's no no one who makes good money on Bitcoin in in Iran, right? Uh, at least in the U.S., you have a bunch of businesses that make good money by just being Bitcoin only. Mm -hmm. But in Iran, money comes from shitcoin, right? So there's no one who is advocating for Bitcoin except people who are in love with it, right? Like it's a personal interest. And uh, yeah, and, and that was that was probably one of the one of the reasons I also started a Telegram channel to put out uh, some Bitcoin information and some uh, discussions and analysis out there because I felt there is such a need. Um, uh, some days I'm frustrated. Some days I'm hopeful. Uh, it's a long-term game, though. So uh, I think if we keep at it, we can we can make a change. Yeah. There's just so much, so much potential in that space, and I oh, hope yeah. uh, I hope uh, the people find some uh, easier opportunity to get in touch with the outside world and maybe even get involved with the Bitcoin economy more more find some jobs that uh, don't really require you to physically be somewhere because technically speaking like just thinking about the technical capabilities i'm very very bullish on how much of a uh, how much of a skill uh, or talent pool exists there it's just other problems um including political challenges that prevent them from um you know making an impact mm -hmm. so um uh, and I think it, it it will get resolved, but who knows when. Mm -hmm. Before I want to ask you, um, but you know, like your macro overview or perspective, like about BRICS, Russia, China, whatever, India, Iran, bilateral, multilateral treaties, the Silk. What do you call? What do you call? What, what what's the Belt Belt? Uh, Silk Road. Yeah, initiative. I mean, there's, I mean, lots of investment money f flowing back and forth. Oh, the detachment the from the U.S. Bill? dollar. I mean, um, I want to ask you about that and, and and the final question. But but before that, about tourism, because I you know I heard I hear a lot of people you know every, everybody who goes to Iran is like you know they just love it. Their people are so friendly. They're you know I mean it's just a Iranian hospitality and mentality. You know they're just so nice. Everybody's cooking and 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 they just love Iran. You know and I I thought. God, I mean, tourism could be a great, you know, spot for uh, or uh, what do you call it, a marketing uh, gap, you know, for for using Bitcoin, you know, uh, uh, as as soon as people realize, oh my God, this is as you said, as you mentioned, you know, some uh, previously, it's a deflationary money, you know, it's appreciated in value. I mean, what do you want to, you know, trade or whatever, do commerce or or business in 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 shitcoin or whatever or fiat or or real or whatever. So where do you see that going? Well, um, you know, the model I have in my head is for the six, the last six or seven decades or more, the dollar has become the bedrock of global finance. And some of that was because of the military power and political push but the dollar system, the global dollar system has grown way beyond the US. So every other financial institution that might 
have had the choice to use any other currency gradually chose dollars because of the network effect. And uh, generally, it's a lot easier to, for everyone to use the same thing, right? Um, and then like the amount of dollars that are offshore and outside of the control of the Federal Reserve and the US uh, uh, system is enormous. No one knows how much, but everyone knows it's several times more than uh, the domestic dollars. So uh, it's, it's a gigantic global system. Uh, and I do know that there is conscious effort by uh, China and maybe other countries to introduce something else. Actually, there are explicit uh, 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 mentions by Chinese officials that we want to introduce something uh, that competes with the dollar. And this year, Russia also has strong incentives to um, uh, go, uh, you know, adopt something else. Uh, sanctioned countries, including Iran, they have a strong incentive. And so think about like China is one of the biggest exporters, one of the biggest importers, um, Russia, Iran, these oil countries. And I think Saudi Arabia is also a candidate to join this coalition, India as well. So if you put all these together, you have a you probably have a critical mass of economic activity that can provide some potential for introduction of a new currency. However, uh, it's going to be so much less efficient because, again, you're breaking a huge global network into two pieces, right? And then it becomes uh, significantly less efficient. Um, and also, what is the alternative, right? So. If all of the, probably in, in that pack, the most powerful currency would probably be Yuan. And it's it has its own troubles. Like if you want to operate a global currency, first of all, your, your currency should be everywhere. You, you should be well distributed. Uh, then you should have deep markets that are very, very liquid and open. Um, well, China doesn't have those. They want to have like tight control over the currency and capital flow. So it doesn't appear to, they, I think the way I think about it, they want to do it, right? But still they don't find a good alternative. And uh, my thinking is like, there's a lot of discussion and there's a lot of money being made uh, selling newsletters, ex you know, telling people, oh, it's gonna be next year or imminently happening. Uh, I'm just more skeptical because this is a lot more than wanting. You need, uh, probably maybe a decade of work before some alternative currency could 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 work. Um, and who knows, maybe by that point, Bitcoin is big enough to, to capture a huge market share from the dollar. So, uh, I mean, if you adopt Chinese uh, fiat, how is it much better than adopting the dollar? Um, you're still, you know, beholden to the operator of that currency for all, all the things that can happen with the dollar can also happen with the Chinese yuan. So I'm not sure that if it's actually be uh, much of a step up, um, but at least something neutral like Bitcoin. Uh, with that, you can be confident that this thing is not going to be controlled by anyone. So you, you will never lose access, for example, which is going to be hugely important for these countries. Although the, the, the big problem with Bitcoin is it's so small, it doesn't have the capacity for now to support international business. But I'm so excited about what's happening in Iran, if it actually gains some uh, momentum and some real business activity, international business activity happens with uh, Bitcoin, it will probably be the first time, you know, a government is seriously using um, Bitcoin as, an, as a settlement um, um system for their trade um so if that's the case if it if a few other countries also do this then you you'll have a huge amount of uh, you know deep pocketed institutions that now need to hold bitcoin as a, as a means to transact and that's how you know a snowball effect starts so i'm very excited about that and i'm just looking to see how much of um, real effect follows after this regulation is announced. Initially, I was very skeptical, right? But when I uh, actually read the um, directives, I, I my feeling is this is a serious effort. So.
yeah, we'll see. Oh, that's great that you have, I mean, you can read and write, and write or, or understand parts because I can't, but that's great if you can like, you know, go to the sources to the, that's, that's really amazing, you know, um, that's really valuable. Uh, you can verify it, <laughs> you know, don't trust, verify. Wow. It's amazing. So where do you see, uh, I mean, you partially uh, already answered a lot of questions, like, which I wanted to ask, like, uh, do you see like a gradual and sudden process, hyperinflation or whatever chronological consequential events do you see like recession, depression or sudden hyperinflation? I mean, like globally, like do, do you do you see like the pain point reaching a tipping point in the next couple of years or I don't know, what's your perspective for Bitcoin, you know, for the sake of Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always uh... Uh, challenging to uh, predict, uh, but a few things I would mention is uh, generally our uh, the global financial system is not working. If you look at the GDP growth after 08, you know previous prior to 08, it's been growing uh, exponentially. If you just look at the global GDP or US GDP, uh, it's been growing super super fast. But right after 08, it's just uh, it hit a wall and it fell off trend. Uh, and it's growing at a much slower pace. Um, you know, central bankers and uh, these uh, media economists always celebrate growth, but this growth is a lot lower than the trend. And with every with every disruption that happens, with every depression, uh, recession that happens, you fall into another slump where your growth is even slower than before. So right after COVID, we are actually now growing a lot slower than we were before COVID. Um, we hardly even uh, gain back anything close to the prior job levels. I don't think. Yeah, we actually we actually at this point have lower, fewer people working than than prior to the pandemic. Uh, and, and same thing, GDP is also growing at a slower pace than before, which was still very low uh, compared to the pre-08. So it it there are you know structural problems that are not being addressed, and it. They get hidden whenever you have uh, a bull market, when everything grows and credit grows. Uh, so for some years, things look good, but ultimately um, you see w w something breaking and causing the whole system to crumble. Uh, and I, I expect these events to become a lot more frequent because now... Uh, you know, cross cross border capital estimates that we have three hundred and fifty trillion dollars of debt out there, and the whole global economy is a hundred trillion. So debt is three times more than the 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 economy. Uh, so as we have grown, as the global economy has grown, we have uh, basically expanded credit to really uh, unsustainable levels, and we have a very fragile financial system that is only waiting for a strong blow to break apart. Right. Um, and, they, and these things happen uh, every few years, like the issues we have with COVID. Also, it's interesting that even if COVID didn't happen, there would be sufficient reasons for us to get into a serious trouble. Um, uh, there was signs of recession before that as well. And these things will happen uh, from now on, you know, every few years and uh, probably every time stronger than before. And central bankers always resort to uh, the regular playbook of quantitative easing and dropping rates. And who knows, maybe they try to improve their uh, effectiveness through uh, the use of uh, CBD seasonal. But because they are so bureaucratic that they don't try to do some real research into what's wrong in the global economy. They will only create more trouble. Like last year, they expanded credit so much. So some of that credit actually in, ended up in, in the real economy and created some positive, but most of it ended up turning into speculation yeah. uh, and pumped as, you know, yeah. asset prices and created more, uh, more trouble um, uh, down the road. So it will basically be like every time we have a recession, they will come back with a bazooka. Uh, they will inject credit everywhere. That's going to create a lot of people, a lot of new rich folks. And then the aftermath of that is inflation, uh, which creates a lot of poor folks. 
uh, and exceedingly these two groups will be different. Um, and on top of that, connect, connecting this to Bitcoin, um, you know, right now we, we are in this huge deflationary environment. Like people always mistake, they say, they think because like energy is getting more expensive, Bitcoin should also grow. Mm -hmm. But actually, when you think about credit, we are in a deflationary environment this year. Um, that's why Bitcoin is down. It, it, it will only take a change in the credit environment, probably sometime next year to uh, cause a new bull run for all the uh, assets that are doing really bad right now. Um, so underlying, if you don't think about the midterm fluctuation, Bitcoin is constantly growing. The network has never stopped growing. Yeah. And uh, because of its features, it will always be uh, on the balance on average growing versus the fiat. And the more this happens, the more people realize that this is happening. And the more people jump on board, as a result, the stronger the growth will be. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I see central bankers just keep playing this game of uh, uh, changing the money supply and always to the side of expansion. Um, so there's a huge expansion and a little bit of contraction, which causes a huge breakdown in the system. Then they go back to that huge expansion again, right? So ultimately on the balance, uh, it's always in one direction. And uh, Bitcoin will keep uh, gaining uh, market share, uh, market cap. So, and, and I don't see any way this would play um, uh, otherwise. And when that happens, like I said, the only problem for Bitcoin to become a, a global money is, is its size. And one way to think about it is its saleability. Like there are yeah. not many institutions, not many countries, not many counterparties who would accept Bitcoin. Uh, you need it to be uh, kind of a well-distributed, well-accepted uh, medium of exchange around the world. Uh, for you to be able to do some serious mm -hmm. transactions with it. Uh, this will happen with time uh, because, you know, so far it's, it has constantly and exponentially grown. And uh, as long as fiat is as horrible as it is, it will keep growing until it reaches that, that point beyond which uh, it, it, is, it is a viable uh, means of international um, a trade like right now if if i if i know that when i travel to another country there will be other businesses that accept my bitcoin i have no other reason to keep any other nonsense fiats then have to, i have to go through banks i have to i don't know think about exchange rates i have to uh probably uh worried about worry about fees my credit card needs to work with the other network that's in that other country it's it's a very bad experience and it only survives because uh, we, we don't have any other uh, alternative and there's kind of a governmental monopoly over that, right? Um, but now we do have an alternative. It's just too small right now. Right, exactly. Um, final question. Um, you know, uh, you probably know, I heard about Samson Mao, you know, CEO of Gen3, wh whose mission is hyper-Bitcoinization. You know, they're doing great work, you know, together with uh, with the investors, you know, Max Kaiser, Stacey Herbert, a lot of other people. And El Salvador, what's your take? What's What do you think about El Salvador if it could lead by example? Like, you know, a real prosperous abundance of, of economies, of hyper-Bitcoinized economy, Bitcoin city. Maybe even, you know, eventually it will become the unit of account. I mean, do you see like small countries like El Salvador you know, following the into the footsteps of, of El Salvador, and that would sort of trigger the hyper Bitcoinization process globally. Yeah, I mean, going back to going back to the model I I was explaining previously, like you have a bunch of countries that are the core beneficiaries of the fiat, right? But on the fringes, you have other folks who are benefit who are not benefiting, right? Either intentionally being put aside, or their own currency is so non-functional that. Um, they they need to find an alternative so they're forced to find an alternative right uh generally governments don't want to change anything that that's that's working so there are several of these smaller players um that are at the fringes of the fiat uh, sphere so to speak uh, these have strong incentives actually to adopt uh, a new currency again like i said there are there are right now it's it's not that 
viable not that easy to adopt bitcoin and already i mean with all these fluctuations i can imagine a lot of people are not super excited about uh, uh, bitcoin in el salvador uh, initially, I was like so excited. I was crying at hearing the news because, you know, this was the first thing. Just one year before that, we were all t t telling all these uh, non-believers that you know, there would be countries using this thing. And someday, you know, this is a dream. But at that point, you know, within uh, um, a couple minutes after Jack Mallers was announcing it, mm -hmm. it became a reality. Um, however, I was looking for um, some some statistics and some data on real changes that Bitcoin has created in El Salvador, at least not having done a serious deep research, but just reading every kind of news piece yeah. that comes out there. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting for, for seeing some actual change. Uh, the, the, the one thing I will mention is they announced one day that I think their tourism grew by 30 percent or something in 2021 so that's positive uh adoption of bitcoin ha has probably had some effect on are we i got a, a error message on on, on zoom no, no. Uh, so yeah it probably had some um uh, some effect on basically elevating the the name of the country you know more people now know about it the same effect that michael saylor benefited yeah. from you know he said after we adopted bitcoin everybody knows about micro strategy right? right so that's one thing um but honestly i'm still looking for some concrete evidence that some real change is happening um but it's gonna happen it's yeah. gonna happen uh maybe not at the time where we have a global downturn and everybody's doing badly um, but I'm also hoping for internal economics in El Salvador to not go really sour because their bonds are not doing really well right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, internally, they have problems and we need this experiment to work. Yeah, definitely. Wow, that was um, a fast, fascinating conversation, uh, Sina. We need to repeat this and uh, stay in touch and uh, hope we can do this. Whoever, you know, maybe a panel with, with Z or other Iranians or, you know, or people, Bitcoiners in general. Um, but hey, thanks so much for, you know, for I learned a lot, <laughs> my listeners too. So uh, do you want to like uh, share where, where, where people can find you or... Yeah, so, uh, well, uh, sorry uh, uh, if I rambled a little bit. No, uh, as a, for, the, <laughs> for the first uh, For the first episode, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. So, um, yeah. Uh, if you want to follow a Bit Guide, uh, well, well, first of all, you can find uh, my account uh, on Twitter. Uh, it's at Sina underline Bit Guide. So, S I N A underline Bit Guide. Uh, and then you can also follow. Bitguide underline IO. Um, we also have a website where what would be interesting for a Bitcoiner there is uh, video courses about the economics and technical side of Bitcoin. Oh. We are still uh, we are still expanding those, but already we have a couple of courses like hour long videos that go deep into in you know the concept of money, history of fiat, also economics uh, principles like uh, two. What's that? Austrian economics, like you know, like uh, Austrian, yeah, I still haven't started that that one, but that's part of our program, yeah. So uh, for now, like I'm in charge of the economics series, and RK is doing the technical side. Uh, economic series covers uh, starts from the concept of money, then history of fiat, pre uh, uh, history of money, uh, pre fiat and after fiat, mm -hmm. and then the next one would be uh, Austrian economics and things like that. So we are oh, developing that. Be sure to check that out. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I also have like for those who are uh, Persians or understand Farsi, I also run a, a Farsi Telegram channel where, uh, again, it's a place for me to ramble about Bitcoin and maybe react to some news events and maybe uh, discredit a bunch of uh, folks who say nonsense stuff or maybe uh, put some context, especially economic context to what's happening. Yeah. Uh, 
you can find all that uh, through the website as well. I'll put it all in the show notes, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it's amazing. I mean, it's just so crazy how much educational work needs to be done. It's really necessary. It's, you know, beginning with the question of what is money? <laughs> you know, or, you know, people even in universities, as you know, you know, they just don't, it's just awesome economics or, you know, it's like maybe you hear it's a it constant, once or twice. <laughs> it's a constant academic pro propaganda yeah, totally. where certain ideas are, like universal truths, and they're not even challenged at all. Uh, one other thing I would say, like confirming what you said about the need for education, like when I tell my students to go research, some, sometimes I give them um, uh, projects and some people choose to do crypto related research and I let them do it. Once they come back, generally um, I see that a lot of the stories and marketing campaign done by uh, these fake projects end up entering their presentation. So the, what happens is you go online, you look for a bunch of resources. And like I said, uh, the first 500 results that you receive in a, uh, in, 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 through a search engine are sponsored content by people who are not incentivized to provide. Uh, you know, the good information. So you, you simply get lost in all those, um, uh, all those uh, distractions, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so huge that signal is completely lost, at, at, you know, for, for a noob, for a person who enters the space uh, uh, recently, you know, the, it, it's like, you know, everyone has that couple of years of getting lost in the noise before they finally find their path. Yeah, so cool. maybe hopefully we can find, we can influence this a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, you're doing really uh, God's work, Satoshi's work. <laughs> so thanks so much, Sina, for this amazing conversation. Let's keep in touch and I uh, hope we can repeat this uh, sometime in the near future together with... Thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed that conversation. Looking Sina, forward thank you to so much. doing it right. again. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Have a good one. Bye. All right, guys, uh, that was amazing. I really enjoyed this. Um, so make sure you follow uh, Sina on Twitter and um, and yeah, and there are a lot of conferences uh, coming up. Uh, probably I can only make it to one that's in Austria, in Innsbruck in Austria, a pretty big, like the biggest Bitcoin conference in the German speaking for in countries. Um, gonna be a lot of prominent Bitcoiners, but if you can attend one of them, you know, in Lugano, I think it's the Bitcoin event with all the Bitcoin legends, uh, beginning with uh, Samson Mao, uh, Adam Beck, uh, Nick Sabo, uh, uh, I mean, just just amazing uh, uh, list of people. So yeah, thanks so much again for um, share this uh, episode with your friends and family, and if you can, value for value, you can also listen on it on YouTube, uh, podcast platforms, Fountain, Breeze, if you want to, you know, uh, sh uh, uh, spend some sets or, you know, donate some sets. And yeah, thanks a lot again. And I'll talk to you soon again. I'll see you soon.